Even the disconnecting blackness of sleep couldn't prevent my subconscious from picking up on the panicked worry that filled the bedroom. Whether it was emanating from myself or from a distant, foreboding presence, I couldn't tell. It was only after I awoke and my blurry gaze was captured by her form, standing in the radiance of a full moon shining through the window, that I knew it was the latter. Like angelic filaments, champagne locks framed her face in tiny ringlets, and although it was turned from me, I knew that her reticent stare was a thousand yards away. Clasped together at her chest, her hands wrung themselves seemingly of their own free will, in sharp juxtaposition with her motionless bust. Her posture, betraying intention by hinting at her unease, was fully evident, and I was acknowledged with silence save a perceptuous glance in my direction. Abby, I whispered, echoing her ambient disquiet. It won't be long now, she stated slowly. Against protesting muscles, I pulled myself from the bed, taking care to stay outside of the moonlit boundary as if hiding from an unseen monstrosity on the other side of the glass. Her gaze never left the shadows or a pitched veil that lurked beyond the safety of our home. I shrouded my face with the curtains and peeked out the window. The notion that some indescribable monster was tearing about the darkened portion of our yard, priming itself for attack, was silly to me. But something about the fear her voice set within me was unmistakable. I turned to question her, but she spoke first. The blue man, she began, and his dog, they're coming for me, Patrick. I took a breath to argue to guarantee that nobody was coming for her, but was struck silent by a dim, yellow light, purposefully sweeping back and forth from the depths of the woods where the moonlight dare not shine. Despite its manifest banality, the faint light seemed threatening. It teased itself as a great interpreter of secrets and sentinel of truth, but its similarity to an ambushed predator would not be far off. Only when it would turn away from us did I feel any sense of what could be considered safety. He's so close, Abby said and put her hand against the glass. I watched her fingers tremble from the growing fear and worry. They're going to find me this time. Her words induced a surge of raw hell inside my stomach. I wanted to save her. I wanted to hide her away from the hunter and his canine minion. I ached to provide her with the peace she desperately needed. My own hand trembled to the point of numbness, but I laid it over the top of hers. She was cold, and I could scarcely tell where the glass ended and her skin began. Abby, I promise you that as long as I've got strength to move, I will keep you hidden. A rapid succession of barks echoed from the forest, and I instinctively gripped down on her hand, but found myself helpless to stop her from pulling it away. I thought better than to call out her name lest the bestial fury of the forest hunters be unleashed upon us, or so I feared. My sanity couldn't take any further torment from our would-be attackers and my palpitating breath indicated as much. Some unwanted entity raised the volume in my head to maximum, exposing my nerves to burning perception. Abby's voice hit me like a frozen whisper from somewhere far away. They're here. Underlying those words, a faint, deliberate <coughs> seeped in front of the edge of hearing, that the sound was all too familiar, my anxiety confirmed by coalescing into pearls of sweat from every pore. It was the haunting sound of metal and earth, passion and anger, comfort and regret. They're here, Abby repeated. Her muffled voice was relenting to the odious racket. They're going to find me. And they're going to find you too, Patrick. That last word stung my ears, causing me to tumble backwards, but I managed to catch myself on the windowsill. My attention was once again pulled outside. The landscape resembled a seasonless portrait of the nocturnal world. Cold unmoving and sterile, until a deviant, nimbus cloud crossed the sky, muddling the fulgent moon, 
A woeful shroud, threaded from a vat of black cosmos, fell upon the world, and the hoary orb of light bobbed and swept as the Hound of Hades snapped its jaws between deafening barks. Everything in the panorama of blackness appeared disembodied, an audible and visual kaleidoscope of lights and darks, snaps and snarls and footsteps, breathing, jealousy, and vindication. It was too overwhelming and my body slid down to the floor as if my joints were painlessly dislocated all at once. Of the ceaseless cacophony, I was terrified, and I felt myself plunging into virginuous depth, sinking further and further while grotesque, imperceptible perversions of reality threatened to siphon my very essence and leave my body in a deflated shell that collapses into a miscarried pile of waste, where I'll rot and deserve silence for the things I've done, wholly forgotten by the populace and the sky and the earth until I become stinking detritus, with no purpose but to erode with the passage of time. Carry down the wind, a demonically bastardized version of Abby's voice called to me from the other side of the window. Come to me, Patrick. I've forgiven you. You will be okay now. Summoning the remnants of my draining energy, I gripped the sill. The old wood groaned in protest under my weight, but I managed to pull myself upright. I looked toward the sky where, from a seemingly intelligent design, a circular breach in the clouds opened and a column of silver everescence beamed down upon her as she stood, solemn, in the center of the yard. Her flaxen ringlets lifted slightly when she smiled at me and the shaft of moonlight followed her every graceful move. When she beckoned me with a comforting, outstretched hand, the light accommodated. On wary legs, I navigated the length of the house to the front door in a complacent haze that the time had arrived for surrender and displayed a velvety sense of serenity. I was more than willing to accept as I eased the door open. Come to me, Patrick. Her voice was no longer coming from any physical source. It was soothing me from the inside, driving my feet forward. Upon exiting the house, I was blinded by a dozen luminous beacons that I could only associate with some variety of a godly eternal gate, but something felt wrong about it all. There was an artificiality to the light, and at its boundary, sibilating voices only added to my growing confusion. Abby? I called to her. I'm sorry. In advance of me, an indistinct but apparently critical conversation was being held. I was forced to shield my eyes from the blazing lights to find its source, but upon lifting my hands, I instantly felt the cold sting of metal against my wrists. Mr. Lyle? A deep voice spoke from behind me. You are under arrest for the murder of your wife, Abigail Lyle. I looked to my left side where a burly, bearded, sweaty man was leaning on the handle of a shovel protruding from a pile of fresh dirt. He refused to make eye contact with me and cast his gaze back down to Abby's makeshift grave that sat half-excavated. From my vantage point, I could faintly make out her soft ringlets. Once champagne, now hoary and dying as they framed her decaying features. The man resumed his duties and drove the shovel into the remaining dirt. 